Hello and welcome to Positive Parenting. I'm Deanne Conrad, Community Relations Supervisor for the Sioux Falls School District. We thank you for joining us today on Positive Parenting. It is a joint venture between the medical and child development professionals of Sanford Health and our wonderful educators in the Sioux Falls School District. Our topic today is preparation for kindergarten and that early childhood development. Uh, those little bodies can be big creatures at times and we're trying to help uh, families with this program to identify some of the things that they can do in the early years to help students, help children uh, become excellent students in the long run. So. We have some guests here today joining us and I will have each of them introduce themselves before our conversation gets started and we will start with you, Tressa. Hi, my name is Tressa Dykstra Van Borst. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. I work in developmental and behavioral pediatrics at Sanford Children's. Thanks. I'm Val. I'm Val Peters and I'm the early childhood coordinator for the Sioux Falls School District. Well, thank you both for being here today to have this conversation. Um, you know, we think of those little bodies uh, but they come with some pretty big uh, requirements in terms of parenting and shaping and um, how important is it? We've learned so much lately uh, in the last several years about brain development and, and what's going on in that time frame. But Tressa, talk a little bit about uh, the complexity of, of babies and the growth and development that, that does happen. Absolutely. Brain development in the first three years of life is crucial. And there's a window uh, of opportunity for those experiences. And I'm sure Val will have more about the educational component, but um, my job in healthcare is to make sure that children are well and uh, healthy, enabling mm -hmm. them to experience um, as much as they can. And so making sure their hearing and their vision are adequate, they're getting enough rest, they're getting good nutrition, um, allows them to be ready for those social experiences that, that help them be good learners. Right, and what happens if, you know, if, if kids are missing out on a component of that? Um, is it, I mean, do we see those, those challenges? If, if we miss that window of opportunity that you're talking about, um, how, how crucial is that window of opportunity? And is there the ability to correct if that window of opportunity has been missed? It's hard to quantify. I think um, it's ideal when children have those experiences. I think it gives them the uh, opportunity to achieve their highest potential, but I think that we're always growing and developing, and when a child hasn't been able to have those experiences, for whatever reason, there still are opportunities um, for to them to overcome. Yeah, absolutely, to catch overcome up. and catch up. Wonderful. Well, um, Val, your role in the Sioux Falls School District is, is really to work with children who are before uh, the, those kindergarten years, mm -hmm. which uh, you know traditionally we think of five years old as kindergarten, but uh, we know that some children are not quite ready at five, and it takes a little longer. Um, red shirting, I think they call that. <laughs> <laughs> but talk to us a little bit about what um, the Sioux Falls School District does. What role the district has in helping families uh, in those early years? Um, the Sioux Falls School District has a variety of programs um, that can help support children and families as kids are growing and developing and getting ready for school. Um, we have a birth to three program which focuses on children who have developmental delays or disabilities prior to the age of three um, and therapists and educators um, provide those services in the home or the natural setting for a child. So it might be the child's home or in their child care setting. The real goal of that is not just to help children gain the skills they need, but to help parents and caregivers be that child's primary teacher because that learning occurs all day long, not just in the half hour or hour that staff are with mm -hmm. families. So mm -hmm. helping parents learn how to to best meet those needs for their children. And then from three to five, we do have an early childhood program through the district that serves really a targeted population of children. So the funding for that program comes from Head Start, Title, um, migrant funding, as well as special education. So the children who come to that program are children who are um, eligible for the program, and that eligibility means there's a need for it, and often those kids come delayed. And our goal is to help get kids 
caught up or give them the skills to be able to go into kindergarten really ready to learn. Sure, so those, that, that crucial time, the window, what, what is that age range? You know, it starts all the way at birth, those, mm -hmm. those experiences that newborns have when they look into a parent's eyes and that attunement process when they make a face and the parents react. Um, so starting very early to language exposure, lots of talking in the home, um, just that, those give and take of social experiences. Right, we don't often think of, you know, there, there are so many things to think about with a new baby and yeah. you bring them home and you don't necessarily think about oh the educational component of just right. that regular chatter in the home but that um, that is a, a key part to their development as well absolutely yeah. yeah well when when you're going into the home Val for say the birth to three mm -hmm. program um, what examples are you giving or how tell us a little bit about the kinds of things that you're coaching parents on I think it helps for parents to really understand what's happening in those little brains at that very young age. Like you said, it, it starts um, even prior to birth that kids are social. They, they need to have meaningful interactions with their environment, with the people in their environment, and they need to be able to make those connections, if you want to call it connecting the dots, and, mm -hmm. and that building that foundation so that as I learn new things and I get older, it, those dots are connecting and I'm like, oh, that makes sense to me. Um, and that happens through that interaction. And 85% of a child's brain development occurs before they walk through a kindergarten door. That to me is just huge. That is amazing. That when I hold that little baby, I think, oh, this is the start <laughs> of all of that. And I think it helps for parents to understand that so that they can look at what's happening in that home and making sure that it's really good quality and engaging for kids, that they're talking to kids, that they're using language that kids are, you know, think about the words you use with kids. Those are the words kids are gonna be reading when they hit first grade, second grade, third grade. So the more they hear those words, the, the more they can connect what they mean, that lays a foundation for reading skills later on. So things that parents can do at home uh, just occur in everyday life, but talking about them, reading, giving kids an opportunity to create, to, to problem solve, to, to start that conflict resolution process mm -hmm. with siblings or parents, um, you know, early counting skills, literacy skills. It, it's so easy to incorporate every day with things that are happening mm -hmm. every day in everyday life. So that time, obviously the bond mm -hmm. between a parent and a child, um, is going to be critical as well, uh, and, it, and that encouragement and, and that type of thing. Um, and when that's missing, I, I suspect that there, that is a significant part of, you know, if the, the parent becomes ill or something yeah. along that line and isn't able to care for the child. How, how important is that connection between the, the parent and the child? I mean, they are really the first, first teachers. That's a very important connection and it's hard um, throughout a person's lifetime to overcome that loss of not having that, that parent connection. Mm -hmm. So it is so important for parents um, who have health concerns or other concerns to have their own needs met so that they can be that um, attachment figure for their child. Mm -hmm. And then those experiences like Val was talking about, the basic conversations and things um, it, you can't really have too much of that can you and it can't really be no. the TV exactly <laughs> I think it um, you know sometimes we get sucked into thinking the latest app on our phone or Mozart videos or things that we can buy and hang in front of our child are going to make the difference but it, it really is those kind of mundane activities going to the grocery store and baking in the kitchen and bathing and all of those experiences that have everything a child needs to learn school readiness. So it's not necessarily th those items, those tools you buy mm -hmm. might be helpful but not necessarily uh, necessary. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Exactly. They they may you know serve as some sort of enrichment, but I don't I don't think that they're necessary. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, that's um, important to know that the the connection that parent is making is is so critical, so crucial. Um, so those families that we're working with early on, 
um, it's not that we have to be working with them, but it's just basic good practice for, for families to have conversation and um, early exposure. Mm -hmm. And that reading to a child too. Reading is one of the best things that you can do for your child. Read, read, read. And you know, books can open up worlds for mm -hmm. kids. And so when you aren't able to go to the zoo or get out to an activity to provide that authentic experience for a child, there are so many ways that you can build that vocabulary and give those experiences through a book. And, and reading to children, having them look at pictures and tell you about the pictures, having them start to look at those words and make the connections between the letters and the sounds that they're hearing, make predictions. What do you think is going to happen mm -hmm. next? So pick stories that have a storyline, um, not just a repetitive line, but a storyline that kids can actually predict what's going to happen and then determine if they were right in that prediction. Mm -hmm. Um, books can help kids learn about conflict, how to make a friend, how to be a friend, how to keep a friend, how to resolve conflicts um, with friends and build that vocabulary for them as well. I'm always fascinated by the, the children's books. Um, we have participated in the Dolly Parton mm -hmm. Imagination Library mm -hmm. and received those books at home. And uh, there's a children's book for absolutely everything. <laughs> and that is a great resource for families. We connect families to that, but if they aren't connected to it already, a child gets a book every month of their life up to the age of five mm -hmm. at no charge for families. Yeah. And it's just a wonderful opportunity for families to start building their library. Right. And that reading connection too has to be a big one um, as well. I, I know the book that we I, I, it's my favorite children's book, and my kids know that, and if I say to them, what's my favorite book, they know my favorite book. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's fun to be able to have that conversation about um, what is this book telling us, and it happens to be about a, uh, it's a mother for Chaco, it's a strange looking mm -hmm. bird, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I just love the storyline because it, it, it helps kids understand that Everybody looks different. Everybody is Absolutely. different. Um, so there's so much to be taught from mm -hmm. those those books, and it's important to expose kids to that. I agree. I think the language exposure is wonderful. I think the physical proximity of sitting side by side mm -hmm. with your child, the the give and take, the the eye contact that happens. Um, mm -hmm. That's all, all important. All important, certainly. So those experiences we know. Um, academic experiences, but also you sort of mentioned too, those those basic experiences like going to the grocery store, going to the park. It doesn't have to be something that costs money mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. Um, it is just the driving down the street and when the child's in the safety seat in the back saying, do you see the red sign? Do you, you know, tell me what you see right now? And sharing those and having that conversation that can be like you said, authentic. Yeah, you can match socks with your child at home as you're oh, folding laundry. If they're setting the not table. Not if they're missing. <laughs> <laughs> and that always happens. I know. Setting the table, ask how many are in your family. And if there are five in your family like ours, give them four plates. Have them set the table. And when they find there's one missing, hmm, you have four plates. There are five in our family. How many more plates do we need? So you're putting those real life experiences something that makes sense to them and has meaning to them and now we've added a, a component that's more academic to it so we're starting to get some number sense there you can do the same things with letters um, as you're grocery shopping and kids have favorite foods kids learn to read at a very young age McDonald's at the age of two kids can tell you what that symbol means and that's a reading skill sure. so cut out the boxes the cover to the macaroni and cheese box and tape it to a piece of paper and that's their grocery list so as you're going through the store they can tell you when it's time to stop and get that they grocery they're that. starting to match those symbols and those signs which are really matching words yeah absolutely that that is amazing and, and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be cost prohibitive it can just be a very basic uh, very basic everyday skills. activity so, yeah you know um, sometimes children have difficulty expressing themselves um, as they're learning these things, there's a whole world coming at them mm -hmm. very quickly. Um, and they're learning things at just, you know, the, a very fast pace. However, 
it can get frustrating for mm -hmm. children as well. There can be information overload. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, how, how is that exhibited? Usually that comes out in behaviors or, or something along that line. Is that your, or is the medical experience? Right, I think you're exactly right. There's mm -hmm. a lot of changes going on. They're growing rapidly and sometimes they're not able to cope with all of that. And so the terrible twos as we call them are really that time um, when kids are having those emotions, but they're not yet able to put words to it. And so it comes out in displays of, um, you know, on the floor or mm -hmm. refusal, and it's a normal part of child development. It rarely needs intervention. Um, mm -hmm. Probably the best thing to do is to ignore the behavior. And then when the child is displaying appropriate or, or good behavior, lots of positive, authentic praise for that. Um, and most kids transition through those rough uh, years just fine. Mm -hmm. You wonder if they're ever going to end. Right. <laughs> I always thought the terrible twos were more like, you know, they led very much into the threes. I was thinking when two yeah. was done, we were going to, you know, it was going to be sunshine and roses, but yeah. <laughs> it takes a little time and everybody has a little different process for getting through that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think as a parent, the things that you can think about when you're going through those times is, is my child getting enough sleep? Do I have the appropriate expectations for their developmental level? And, and are they getting the playtime they need? So are things coming at them at an okay pace? Um, and sleep is such a critical, critical piece for child development. And as kids get closer to that school age, just making sure that those routines are in place for those things that their little bodies need to be able to recharge are happening. Right. right. I'm a huge proponent of bedtime, mm -hmm. always being at the same time. Um, I've, and I, I guess I, I don't even want to apologize for that because mm -hmm. I think it's so critical to their health. And I feel like that's a reason that my children generally are not ill. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that they've had that downtime and, mm -hmm. and that can, can be an important component. Um, what does research tell us about that necessity for sleep? Uh, research would say that sleep is very important for physical and emotional well-being. And a lot of times children who are displaying difficult daytime behavior, it will get better if they get more rest at night. So like Val said, having a consistent early bedtime mm -hmm. that allows them that time to unwind and recharge um, it's good for parents and it's good for kids. Yeah, because we need yeah. to recharge as parents mm -hmm. Absolutely. too. And young children need a considerable amount of sleep, 10 hours of sleep, mm -hmm. which is, if you think about that amount of time, that's a large chunk of time, which mm -hmm. means bedtime does need to be consistent and fairly early as little ones um, are developing. Yeah, so, so all of those sort of at-home experiences, how do we know um, and I think it probably has to be one of the questions you probably get the most. How do I know when my child is ready for kindergarten other than their birth date and the number on the cake now says five, mm -hmm. so yeah. I should send them to school. But what, what, do, what do parents need to know when they're considering uh, kindergarten? I mean, the expectations are different than when they are. I went to kindergarten. <laughs> they are. Mm -hmm. um, I think that as parents look at that, should I send my child to kindergarten, should I not? Um, I think one of the, the biggest things that can contribute to a child's success is that um, social interaction and that ability to engage with peers and adults, um, to be able to be independent in a school setting. They're always with others um, mm -hmm. and always supervised, but that ability to put my own shoes on, to put on my own coat, to be able to take care of my washing my hands and going to the bathroom by myself, eating at lunch, um, those routines that happen throughout the day, being able to transition away from mom or dad or the mm -hmm. caregiver to get to school. And that's hard for kids that as kindergarten starts, sometimes harder for us as parents to let go. I was just let gonna go. say that. <laughs> um, and so we as parents need to model that positive behavior and school is gonna be really fun and I'm gonna see you at 2.45 or mm -hmm. five o'clock when I come pick you up mm -hmm. and make that a positive experience. But looking for that social emotional as my child, have that maturity to be able to be in a full day, if kindergarten for you is a full day um, program, to be able to follow those directions um, and participate um, as independently as possible. Um, 
to have some foundations of learning is great for kids, but kids come to kindergarten with all different levels of skills and they'll learn those skills in kindergarten mm -hmm. with the ability to follow directions to participate in a group activity to interact with peers and adults is probably one of the biggest for kids to be able to have a smooth transition. Sure. Do you get that question also as a provider? Mm -hmm. uh, how do I know when my child is ready? I get that question a lot especially since um, we're working in a field where parents bring their children when they're concerned about their development or behavior. Um, so I agree with the things that, that Val said. Um, from a health perspective, I think it is important for parents who have concerns to visit with their, their pediatrician or their regular provider about those concerns and for red flags, moving on to um, more specialized care if you need so that kids are as ready as they can be. And then general health things that we talked about earlier, making sure that they're seeing well, they're hearing well, mm -hmm. and any underlying medical issues are, are attended to. Right, absolutely. That, that health and wellness of the child and, and ready is important, just yeah. like the readiness is as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. So those um, experiences then, it's not just when they turn five or when they turn six, but what's the benefit of waiting if you feel like your child is like I have a, my middle daughter her birthday is August 26th um, she would have made the September 1st cutoff uh, which is the law in South Dakota to go to kindergarten at the age of five um, but there were just some social things that you know she could cry just on a dime, drop a dime and she would be mm -hmm. crying. <laughs> no one really knew why and, and those types of things. So we did wait to send her mm -hmm. till to sixth grade. She was in a uh, all day called junior kindergarten and, and an all day program, um, but not kindergarten mm -hmm. yet. I feel like that was a really good opportunity for her to become uh, the person that she is today. Um, I've never heard anyone say, gosh, I should have sent my child to kindergarten when they were five. I mean, there's always that, that question, and I always think there's two things I never hear people say. I should have quit piano earlier. Never hear anybody <laughs> say that. <laughs> and I never hear them say, oh, I wish I would have sent her when she was five. Parents have a variety of reasons of why they hold their child for another year and why they send their child. Um, I have three children, they're all in college now, one when she, they're all July 5th birthdays, it's a fluke, but they, wow. they, um, <laughs> she does have a set of twins that, though, so yeah. that's, that's one fact. My daughter, when she turned five, was very tall for her age, and she's very, um, she was a mature socially, mm -hmm. um, little thing, she's good at attending, so we sent her mm -hmm. on to kindergarten. Um, there were times when I thought, oh, learning is really kind of hard for her mm -hmm. right now, but you know, that passed and sure. a 4.0 student in high school. Can't ask so, you for know, anything like She did just fine. That. <laughs> um, the boys, um, with that July birth date, um, we decided to wait mm -hmm. an additional year. It just seemed like for that development socially and, and for um, attending. It, mm -hmm. it, they're just so busy bodies. They're moving mm -hmm. all the time that we opted to do an additional year of preschool mm -hmm. um, to give them that time to grow. and. Um, to, do this, to this day, I feel really good yeah. about all of those choices. But parents know their kids better mm -hmm. than anybody. And so they're gonna be able to look at their child and say, when's their birth date? How are they doing maturity-wise? Right. What is the best thing for them? Right, and we have, we have a June 16th birthday. We sent her, again, oldest mm -hmm. child, mm -hmm. very, mm -hmm. um, Everything's black and white. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of gray in her world. It's, oh, those are the rules? Okay, mm -hmm. I'll follow them. Um, you know, yeah. so that birth order too probably has a little bit of something to do about readiness as well. I agree. Um, I have five children and we have two of our girls with summer birthdays who uh, display good readiness. Mm -hmm. And we sent um, 
my twins, on the other hand, we were lucky, and they had a birthday just after the cutoff date. Oh, so they were no decision they were needed. No decision <laughs> needed, and I think you know that would have been a, a more difficult decision uh, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. I agree with Val that it's really an individual decision. For me, as a parent, um, it was helpful to talk to the the preschool teacher and get sure. a good sense of social skills, academic skills, and then make that that decision. And they're uh, all so very different. I said, yeah, kids, they're all cut from the very same mold, right. the, you know, and yet so incredibly mm -hmm. different. They're and complex. Parents, yeah. <laughs> There's so many opportunities for parents to learn more about what happens in kindergarten. So if you're not sure, are we ready or not? Now's a good time to visit a kindergarten mm -hmm. classroom or talk to a kindergarten teacher or a principal at a building, um, someone who's involved in, in knowing what happens in the day um, of a life of a kindergartner to be able to figure out is my child ready, ready for, that? for that exactly and there are opportunities uh, in typically in January of every year we have a here comes kindergarten mm -hmm. sort of here's the basics of how um, it looks during a school day and and would your child be ready we also have um, a screening opportunity that families can participate in um, do you happen to know the phone number off the top of your head? I do. <laughs> That's at our Early Childhood Screen and Evaluation Office, and the phone number for that is 367-8488. And you just call and say that you'd like to screen for your child. If you're concerned about their development, that always helps for us to know what areas you're concerned about. Um, but it's a free opportunity for parents to see how their child is developing in the areas of motor and cognitive. Um, communication, social, emotional, and adaptive, which are those adaptive skills are those skills that kids just get better as they get older, taking care of themselves, sure. attending to tasks. And sure. so parents can learn how their child is doing and use that information to decide, do I think my child's ready? And also get a few ideas of what you can do at home right. to help your child. And then in the spring of every year, we have uh, the kindergarten open house or registration type mm -hmm. thing. And so that'd be a great opportunity to, to, to visit a school and find out if they're, you know, if, if your child is specifically ready for the challenges of kindergarten. We've talked a lot about, uh, a, lo about a lot of different things here this, this, today, and it's, uh, I think, something we always have to be on top of, thinking about, top of mind, how are we helping our children develop as well, so that when they get to school, they can be ready to learn and grow as a person as well. So we thank you today for joining us on Positive Parenting.